uh, during that time, when people talked about China and the internet, they jokingly asked, well, what are the Chinese going to do? Put a million people in school gymnasiums and let them control the internet? Well, as it turned out, uh, China put even more people to the task and uh, as of right now is using the internet pretty successfully, I might add, to observe and control more than one billion people. So this is one, only one of many reasons why it is crucial for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, to talk about the future of the internet. An internet that is not only uh, enabling economic growth, uh, but also strengthens open societies. Um, that is why it is important for us to bring together actors and stakeholders worldwide who advocate of uh, a free and open internet. And uh, that is why we are pleased to provide uh, an opportunity for this panel of distinguished experts to discuss uh, the future of the internet. Um, I wish you all a stimulating discussion and ask you, Eduardo, to take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for coming around to our panel. I have a dream team here with me in this panel. I'm Eduardo Magrani, fellow at Conrad Adenauer Foundation, professor of digital rights and intellectual property in Brazil. Just to introduce very briefly the speakers we have here today. So Mr. Fabricio Rothschild, um, representing the international UN level, under Secretary General and UN Special Advisor to the Secretary General. Ms. Miranda Seasons, representing the private sector She's currently Director of Human Rights, Product Policy and Engagement at Facebook. Ms. Telwi Ling, representing Academia, Senior Fellow at the Center of Excellence for National Security at RSIS. Uh, Mr. Hon Bagiri, representing Government, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. Mr. Carlos Afonso, representing civil society. He's currently director of ITS in Rio, a member of the Network of Centers. And Mr. Kaubor, representing the EU level, EU region, member of the European Commission, deputy head of the cabinet commissioner of Maria Gabriel. So thank you very much to compose this panel. The motive of this panel is to discuss, discuss the future of the internet, so it's now or never. Um, this panel will be divided in three different rounds. The first round, in the first round, I would, I would like to address which are the guiding principles, the guiding values for each stakeholder, since we have many of them represented here in this panel, because we think that we might have a shared vision for the future of the internet, but if you think that we do not have so far an open and free, imagine the what from now on. So I would like to ask for each stakeholder, what is the what for um, each one of them? So which are the guiding values? So in this first round, I will have the same question for all of them. And this round will have 20 minutes, only three minutes per speaker, if you are fine with that. So very quick replies. On the second round, um, also with 20 minutes, I will address specific question, trying to gather what are the specific challenges of each stakeholder, and mainly what are the challenges they are facing to fulfill this vision that they stated on the first round. So also a kind of self-evaluation, self-reflection on what they are doing towards the fulfillment of this vision. And on the third round, we'll have 30 minutes of reactions from the panelists, the speakers, and also from you in the audience. So if you want to make any questions, feel free to note it down. I will come over with a microphone in the end of our session. We'll have, we'll have half an hour roughly for that. So with that said, I will like to pass the mic to Mr. Hochschild to bring his impressions on what should be the guiding values and principles since you went do a um, great job in trying to create this international cooperation among different stakeholders. So please. Thank you. Um, I think the, the official UN position is that values and norms that have been agreed upon uh, in, for the analog world apply equally 
uh, in the digital world. So human rights, for example, um, have to be upheld as much in the digital realm as in the uh, analog world. But more specifically, um, I think an important value would be universally affordably accessible, which we haven't reached yet, despite good progress. I think another would be safe. I think you know, the, the right to privacy um, is challenged in the digital era and is likely to become more challenged with 5G technologies. Um, a third would be, I'd say, do no harm. I mean, that goes beyond human rights. Um, but harm does happen unintentionally and sometimes intentionally through the internet. Um, and we've unleashed forces that I don't think we fully understand quite how to get back in the box um, again. Um, a fourth would be both universal, i.e. truly global, but also one that is sophisticated enough to be sensitive to um, regional cultures and different um, traditions. And again, I don't think we've quite got our head around that challenge of both upholding universality and respecting sensitivity to different um, regional um, or community approaches. Um, and finally, I would add um, upholding the internet as truly a public good, something that can indeed help commerce, help economic growth, growth but ultimately um, is a global public good. So as to the question about what value I would ascribe to the internet in the future, when I thought about this, I was thinking maybe broadly about you know, aspirational values at, um, in terms of how the internet is perceived, but then I remembered, and this is very basic, because I have a background in it as, um, as, as a media, as a media educator, and you know, I remember when I started using the internet, and it was long, quite, quite a while ago, you know, over 20 years, you know, for most of us in the room. <laughs> it is a medium of communication, right? It is, uh, it, it is in and of itself agnostic, it's a platform. Like this stage is a platform, and you can't really describe a platform as having been good or evil. It's actually the actors, some are very good, some could be better, and some really shouldn't act anymore. Um, and we're all playing out our roles, and the actions of these cannot be confused with the internet in of itself. So maybe I'm indulging in semantics, but that's something I had to kind of like make clear for myself. When we talk of the internet, what are we talking about? So in this respect, we have to ascribe values which are in line with the functionality are we talking systemic, of, of its systemic values? So my what would be secure. It's very simple. I, I would really like it to be secure. I suppose it's in line with the work I do as well. Is it secure in terms of its infrastructure, of its use for it? Are we able to trust that it's a reliable medium? And if we talk about the word trust, you, have, you think of words like robustness, consistency, you know, security and dependability. Um, we are increasingly using this to kind of like manage our lives. We are increasingly becoming digital. Now, if we want to keep our eyes on the prize as respects, the positive effects of digitalization and an open and free internet. And what is kind of not lost on me is that we're talking about open and free internet and we're at the Internet Governance Forum, so that's kind of a bit ironical for me. Um, this certainly is not a terminal goal. This is something that's going to be an ongoing challenge. So do we want to speak about the actors? Uh, going back to that analogy I used, uh, is this a conversation about ascribing values to the behaviors as well? I don't know. Uh, what are the cases where users confuse a platform within the internet for the internet itself? And there are situations like that. You know, should there be a clarification of, of, of this? Who, and who gives that clarification? So maybe I'm asking more questions than, than answering them. But that's, that's my what. Thank you very much, Mr. Bu. Thank you. Uh, I'm working for the European Commissioner for the Digital uh, Economy and Society, and there, in a nutshell, you already have the, the basis from which we uh, approach uh, the work, which is largely um, regulatory, but also um, uh, societal. So, um, 
you mentioned open and free internet, we are open society, so it's, it's natural that we want the internet to, to, to replicate that, to be open. Uh, if I want to add to that additional uh, adjectives, if you like, um, a very important one that really informs uh, everything we did over the last few years uh, would be citizen-centric. So really this, this point that the individual is, is the subject of, of this work and not just an object of, of other players. Obviously, we all know that, that, that there are large players, be them states, be they large companies, and they are there, they affect, they have an impact, and that's, of course, also reflected in the kind of regulatory work that we do. But it's still informed by this, by this understanding that it should be the individual who, who counts here. And this, uh, you can replicate that then through uh, cybersecurity policies. So I would also describe to, subscribe to what you just said about security um, to, to when it comes to data protection, uh, for example, when, when it comes to control over your own uh, data uh, uh, online. All of that uh, is very important. And I just to mention a few uh, things that we did uh, in, in, the, in this, uh, in this um, uh, space that reflects these, these values that I just mentioned uh, on the cybersecurity side of course, but also when it comes to electronic identity, really very strongly centered on the individual. When it comes to personal data protection, very strong role uh, for the individual, also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, larger platforms. We have a platform uh, regulation, a new one since last year, very much focused on the power relations and the fairness relations between the large platforms and their users, be they smaller companies or actually uh, individuals. Um, mentioning uh, another hot topic, uh, artificial intelligence, we, uh, we have an initiative out there to uh, to, which basically brings it all together, security, data, uh, uh, and, and uh, the AI technologies and automated decision-making, uh, again, starting from the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, the right to privacy, the right to, uh, to de personal data protection, of course, also to autonomy, to transparency, to democracy. All of that uh, is, is at the basis of, uh, of the work we are doing, and I think we'll have occasion later on to, to visit one or the other of these topics once again. Please, Mr. Bagir. Uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, Vincent Bajiri, uh, and I work for Government of Uganda. And uh, I'll try to bring in the government perspective, but restricting myself to Uganda and not Africa, because I'm not qualified to do that. <laughs> and um, for me, my observation when you talk about the future of the internet is uh, how we reconcile the contradictions reconciliation of the contradictions from the perspective of um, what applies to the analog setting should apply to the internet, what uh, the senior UN official has referred to. And uh, indeed, if you look at the media space, there is regulation. You regulate the media, mainstream media, but there are challenges you know, as far as citizen journalism is concerned. And uh, indeed, when you take action, because that's where the abuse of the internet comes, manipulating identities, um, imposting, as we all know, people using identities that are not theirs, and uh, therefore misleading. And indeed, when uh, governments such as the one I work for come in, it becomes oppression. You're fighting freedom of expression. But this person who, whose freedom of expression we should be respecting is not them. I come from politics. I was a politician for five years in the parliament of Uganda. There were six Facebook pages that didn't belong to me. <laughs> and all the time I made a complaint in the right fora to see that these are put down. Nothing was done until very late after I'd left politics. So the issue becomes, and indeed, when we tried to interrogate, we found out who had set up the pages. Now, that's why I asked the question, how do we reconcile freedom of expression and uh, the realities of abuse? Because the internet as it is, is uh, indeed a platform. And you can't argue the internet is bad because it's a platform just like the road. If you overspeed, you'll get an accident. And just like the internet, if you use it for the right purpose, you get the good or right results. But we have scenarios where, indeed, there's a bit of abuse. So I think the future of the internet, if you're talking about the future, we need to discuss how we safeguard this good platform to ensure that at all times we get the best out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kams. 
So thanks, Eduardo. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and when we think about um, what we could add to open and free, I would suggest diversity, diverse. And this is almost like a tricky suggestion because we are in, a, in an IGF in which banner is one world, one vision. So the tricky part here is how to make sure that inside this idea of one vision, we insert diversity as a value, as a goal, for the future of the internet that we are building in, making sure that we uh, respect uh, uh, regional diversity, gender diversity, uh, language diversity, making sure that this is a value that we all share. And I think this is important to mention here because IGF has been serving as a, a vehicle to bring diversity into the discussions of internet policy uh, and governance. If we think about it, IT, uh, IGF was uh, uh, created back in 2006, the first edition. Uh, in 2006, there was no iPhone. Uh, the iPhone was launched in 2007. Like Facebook was two years old. So it's interesting to see uh, IGF as this vehicle in order to create a forum for dialogue, for a diverse dialogue, including all stakeholders, that travels through all the moments in which our relationship with technology and to internet have been changing uh, from 2006 on. So that, that will be my first, my first remarks for us to take a look on diversity and, and allowing different voices in the future of the internet. Excellent. Please, Mr. Seasons. Now I have to turn on my iPad. Thank you very much. Um, guten Tag, wassalamu alaikum. Free and internet, what a free and open internet, what else would I like to see? I would like to see an internet that is grounded in the world's strongest, fairest, and most global decision making framework. One that can encounter and deal with diversity. And for me, that is the global human rights framework. Now, why would I bother saying something so obvious, especially when Fabrizio has already mentioned it? Because in the noise that surrounds the many debates today and the many legitimate concerns today, I'm not hearing or seeing many other players say that. I'm not just talking about freedom of expression. I'm not just talking about US devotion to First Amendment principles. But I'm talking about a time-tested, country-tested, legal and normative framework that's been with us, signed and agreed by most countries, most states throughout the world for the last 60 years. It's there for a reason. It's there because it is a way that we can debate and answer and make decisions and do trade-offs about the roles of different actors, about how we accommodate sensitivity to culture and language with the need to be citizen-centered and with the roles and duties of governments, of companies and of individuals. And let's be clear of our overall landscape as I speak, that our free and open internet is indeed potentially splintering. Civic space right now is narrowing, not, incre not increasing, and six in 10 countries are repressing rights to assembly, association, and freedom of expression that would allow their citizens to say what kind of internet, or what kind of life, what kind of societies they would like to construct. And so I don't mean human rights just as a rhetorical framework or as an annoying claim, annoying self-righteous claim for justice that human rights activists tend to like to do. But I mean the tests that are involved in the jurisprudence and the norms of the Human Rights Committee in national, in national uh, legislation and of the guidance of the Human Rights Committee on Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights where there are permissible limits to freedom of expression for things like public health, public order, and the rights and dignities of others. And to be framed those restrictions and those tests on four main principles, is the restriction lawful based in the law of the country? Is it legitimate? Meaning, does it have a lawful purpose? Is that law accessible, clear, and precise? Is that restriction necessary? And by necessary, I mean to uphold the rights 
of users or citizens, in this case, in a democracy? And is it proportionate? That is, is it the narrowest restriction required in order to achieve its goal? Because none of the debates that we are seeing now are completely new. Their speed and their complexity may be terrifying. Um, and I fully confess to agreeing with that. But this is part of a great global dance that many people have been engaged in of citizen expression, of political freedom, of security and accountability and regulation for the last at least 60 years. And so we are in a, perhaps in a new phase of that dance, but its overall lineaments and requirements, while complicated, I think are quite clear. Excellent. Thank you very much for your inputs on this. So this is a very good oversight on the principles for each stakeholder. And it seems to me that the future of the internet is going to be a very challenging one. Yes, because although you represent different regions, different cultures, and also different places um, concerning the different stakeholders. We have some overlaps on some principles and values, but also different priorities. And it's going to be very hard to cope with different priorities, right? So many interesting things came up, so how to cope with all of that. So open, free, and what? And this is the what for each one of you. What I would like to address now is a kind of self-reflection, self-evaluation of each stakeholder. What are the steps you are doing so far to fulfill your vision? What are the strategies and also the aftermath? What is going out right and wrong on your strategies so far to fulfill each vision? So starting on the international UN level, a huge effort being made for international cooperation, international digital cooperation. What is going wrong and what is going right in this digital development um, of the digital sphere? We have um, the internet um, in a huge variation. Carlos liked to say this a lot. In less than 20 years, we came from a romantic and enthusiastic point of view for the internet to a more dystopic one, more or less, right? So what are the strategies being developed so far and how are they working out? Is it well or not? We are having a more polari polarized internet. We're having the re radicalization of discourses online. So starting with the international UN level, where are the steps being taken? I think we're trying to c catch up. I mean, as Miranda um, indicated, these are, the internet is a technology that has spread faster than any other technology in human history. Um, it's taken just 25 years to reach 3.7, 3.6 billion people. That, that's never happened before. Um, and that has happened largely thanks to the initiative and the skill of the private sector. I think very few technologies have been so far away from governments. Uh, and governments have been caught unaware and have played, been trying to play catch up. Just five years ago, in Adneb Mundial, um, Jared um, Cohen and Eric Schmidt talked about the internet as the, one of the greatest experiments in ungoverned spaces, one of the greatest experiments in human history and anarchy. That was just five years ago, perhaps today, at least in Europe they wouldn't say quite um, the same thing. But they were also very quick to go on to say that as a result of that, it was also the site of incredible scams. It was also the site of great abuse. It was also the site, for example, of the spread of violent extremism. And this, I think, brings me to a key point. The opposite of freedom is not governance. The opposite of freedom is tyranny. Um, and where you don't have the rule of law, where you don't have good governance, you have tyranny, you have abuse. And I think that's a little um, of what we've seen. And of course, that regulation, and in Europe that's known at least since the French Revolution, 
Um, and I think we've seen a bit of that on the internet, what an ungoverned space can look like um, in, in a negative uh, form. And I think uh, the reluctance to, to, to savor that <laughs> is what has led very much to the fragmentation of the internet and a tendency to push back um, against its universal nature. So I think regulation and governance has to happen first at the national level, then at the regional level, and Europe has led in that regard. But I think if we want to truly maintain this tool as an international global tool, really as a global public good, we also need that to happen at the universal level, at the international level. And that's what we're trying to get discussions around um, at the UN. And the high-level panel on digital cooperation, which was truly international, truly multi-stakeholder, which had young entrepreneurs, human rights activists, big entrepreneurs, academics, government members, I think, and they came to a consensus on the way forward, I think was the first stab at that. I think the need for that is broadly recognized. I think the great difficulty we have now is in the current international environment, which is characterized by extreme rivalry, extreme distrust, and privileging competition over cooperation, it's very difficult um, to make headway. And there, I think, the voices of those who are really advocates of, open, of keeping up an open and global internet need to speak up louder about the need for greater universal norm setting precisely to uphold that. Thank you very much. So we heard a bit on how UN and the international level is doing its effort to reduce fragmentation, polarization, and it's a huge effort to cope with different priorities, right? So what I would like to address now as a representative of academia is what is the role of academia in all that and mainly how academics can achieve impact with their, with their outputs? How can academics t can really reach policy impact to try to enhance this international digital cooperation? And I know, I know you're very much focused on cybersecurity, but you can also get broader than that. Thank you, Eduardo. Okay, so I think my what was, uh, just to remind everybody, was the word secure. So security, I mean, it's kind of in line with what I do. So my work revolves mainly around cybersecurity strategies of small states. I'm from Singapore, by the way. Um, and I'm also looking within the strategy about the resilience aspect, and I'm not only looking at the systemic resilience of the hardware, of the critical infrastructure, but the resilience of the users. I'm talking about psychological resilience of end users, people, you know, people like, like you and I. I mean, if you think about it, we all are nodes, endpoints in this interconnected digital web, which means that we are, firstly, a vulnerability in and of ourselves, but we're also the first line of defense. So with increasing connectedness, with more smart devices, our threat surface is just so much bigger than it was. Um, you know, in, in, in the past. And this is the thing that people, because we're so used now, we can't, we're, we're so used to using smart devices, we are thinking about the internet of things. I mean, my own country wants to be a smart nation, and that's a goal that we've set ourselves. And then we find ourselves thinking about, okay, so how in my work do I, as part of my work is actually informing policy advisory. Oh, that, that the Singapore government will have to think about, will have to create. And a lot of, a lot of the work that, that I do and that my, my colleagues do, we realize that in some way it's going to inform a very practical sort of like approach to how people are dealing with this. And the challenge is, is, is to not get lost in the technical detail, not to get lost in the... Um, in, in looking out for all the, while we have to warn about the harms and, and, and the threats that are out there, but to also provide, these are the things you can think about, these are the solutions you can throw at this. And increasingly, we are seeing that this is not something, let's say, the, 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 like the um, 
you know, the, the military of a nation can do. Not It's something that is beyond the government. It really has to be, because what, have I, what I said earlier on, because we're so in, interconnected, everyone has to play a part. So we, at one point, we were talking about a whole of government approach, and then no, 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 no. It's gonna be a whole of nation. Now the challenge is getting people to be involved in that whole of nation um, enterprise. And this is something that most countries are thinking about. How do we engage with people? Because um, the mindset is, this is an issue of defense. It's an issue of security. Therefore, the government should take charge of it. And it's overcoming that mindset. So I've sat in a few sessions today and I've heard people talk about oh, we need to have more education, we need to kind of like get civil society involved, and it's less a lot of we wish, we should, we must, we must do this, you know, break down the silos. Um, recently, in fact, not three weeks ago, I was actually in Tallinn, in Estonia, and I was talking with people who were involved with the, the cyber defense unit of the uh, Estonian Defense League, and these are people who are regular people, tech, techies, you know, techies, lawyers, you know, who, when there's a cybersecurity incident, they rally to the cause and they answer and, they bef and, and they're like the first responder in that sense. So civil society, I think, plugs the gap where you have the schools taking care of, it, you know, bringing the information in, into the curriculums, where you have um, the, the academics also, when, you, when academics work with civil society, I think it's quite powerful because it brings it down to the, to, the, to the nuts and bolts, to the grassroots level, where the challenge is making this accessible to your grandma, to your grandpa, you know, to, we talk about protecting the young all the time. Let me just remind you all, the young look at the world very differently from all of us. They consume and they absorb information completely differently. We are very linear. We can bounce along maybe in a long linear fashion but the young take from everywhere in a very kind of like random distributed function. I'm also worried about protecting grandma and grandpa, my mom and my dad, you know, and my uncle Bob and my auntie Sue, because they're the ones getting scammed too. So let's not forget about, you know, people other than the young, all right? That's, that's something that I hear all the time. And I'm like, no, you just remember that the young actually will take care of themselves better. I believe that because they are digital natives, we aren't. Well, most of us in the room, I'm not, no one sells to anyone, but I think most of us, you know, we were, we were more analog, we grew up analog and then we converted to digital. So that is, that, that, that's my two cents worth, right? Thank you very much. So you believe academia can also play a role in shaping agenda also from, for the private sector and in the international level and governments and so on. And it's interesting how you brought up the communication skill as part of this, right? So uh, to Mr. Kaubur, um, European Union and Germany are building very strong legal frameworks for different issues. So for example, the, the GDPR in Europe got viral worldwide. We had this hate speech bill here in Germany. We have the directive on copyright also influencing different regions. So what I would like to address is how will you, you imagine this European regulation as highly influencing also other regions? And on the other way around, if you are also, if, if you also take into consideration other inputs coming from different regions to build these very strong and viral legal frameworks. Thank you. Uh, that's a big question, and also I was so inspired by the pre uh, two previous speakers, so I don't know how to cram everything in three minutes. But uh, just one one thought on the, on the cybersecurity. I mean, small countries, a bit longer, very large countries. We all have the same uh, the same uh, challenges. That's that's very clear. And we, I mean, as you you described it beautifully, it's about the individuals. And I think it centers very very well with what I said earlier. Uh, we are asking ourselves the same question. We have the same challenges. How to how to go about not just talking to the countries, but actually to the people in the end, and also to the technologies that will help these people. It's a thought we haven't mentioned so, so, so far uh, very explicitly, but many of these things are not really, I believe, about the difference in value or, or what we want to achieve, but how to achieve it. So large discussions in Europe are always about, okay, what, what should the rule really say in, in the law book in the end, and what will be the impact of that? And the discussion is then at that level, and not about what we want to achieve. Most of the times, many people can actually agree on that. So that's a thought on that. I also wanted to use this opportunity to really commend the work that the UN has, has been doing 
doing and the report on the um, uh, digital cooperation, uh, we really very much support to, to uh, get to the next level also of the IGF uh, history uh, to, because the internet becomes more and more important for all of us. I already mentioned it for the society, of course, also very much for the economy. Um, some of the challenges that, that exist have already been mentioned, and so for that reason, we think it's very important that uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, approach is preserved, but is also developed further, because we, it, it cannot be, you cannot have this, this, this complete, uh, a complete disconnect between discussions where everybody is at the table and then decisions which are taken at, at, at a smaller or sometimes much smaller uh, group. And this is also, I wanted to link that to cybersecurity as well, one of the big challenges we have in Europe is that you always have the governments who think, oh, this is, as you said, it's security, so it's defense, so it's, it's us over here in the interior ministry, and then you have other people, like the industry people who want uh, to entice the economy, and then you have the research people who actually sit on a, uh, on a large amount of money in many instances for public research support, and all of these ones are normally uh, there to, to agree to the overall goal, so where should the money be spent, what should be our priorities, but this is surprisingly difficult, huh? Just now we have a very concrete uh, example for over a year. We have a legislation in, in the pipeline where actually it, it's difficult because in the various European member states, this discussion is still ongoing. Now, uh, to your question, uh, more specifically, of course, we, we are aware uh, that there, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that if you talk about international system, also the trade system, but by the way, but also, of course, the internet, that regulation in one place, especially if it's a rather large place, has an in, uh, influence on what happens elsewhere and what's being thought elsewhere, because you have global businesses who want to standardize their procedures. Uh, for them, if they have to, uh, you know, have run basically two different shops or three or 50 different shops uh, around the world, that's very difficult. So they are looking for consistency, and that's why I think uh, many of the European rules actually, you know, looked at and uh, taken on uh, elsewhere. I actually was there when we drafted the, what became the GDPR. Uh, some of the words are, are by me in there. <laughs> I hesitate to say, but uh, this was 2000, 2011. 2011, can you imagine? So uh, this is really, a, it kicked in last year. So it took seven years from, from the first proposal to actually becoming a law. Uh, and then, of course, the, the actual implementation uh, by companies, individuals, but also internationally, uh, will take many years to come. And I think we are looking also at many clarifications by the court systems over time. So it's a huge endeavor. And that's also, uh, it shows the stakes. It shows you have to get it right. And it also goes back to what I said earlier, that it really depends on the individual uh, rules in the end. I mean, what, what are the behavioral legislation, the behavioral requirements you put on, on companies and organizations, for example, and what will be their impact? And how does that link back to, to the freedoms and rights and the values that you want to defend? Huh? if you want to defend the citizen, but in the end you make some rule that actually uh, results in people just kind of mindlessly having to agree to all kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, data, data processing, because they are asked 20 times a day, you can, you can wonder whether that's really achieving the goal. And these are the kinds of discussion that we are going to have a lot. Going forward, of course, this, uh, this is also not just a bug, but it's also a feature of the system. Of course, we want to export uh, a democratic, open society vision of the world. You know, we are, we are, unap <laughs> you know, we are not ashamed of that. And that's, uh, that's of course, why uh, when also starting from human rights and the fundamental rights uh, um, uh, charter of the European Union, uh, we, we put these rules on the books and we are very very happy if other parts of the world like them and uh, try to uh, apply them as well. And data protection is just a good example because there it's linked to the ec uh, economic uh, requirements, it's linked to the economic opportunities of companies in, in third countries who have chosen to align their legal framework with the European one, so to make it more seamless uh, in, in trade relations, for example. And we think that's a good thing. We think it makes it easier for the societal goals to be achieved citizens' privacy, citizens' protection, but also overall uh, to help the economy. Now I think I've at least doubled my size, so uh, my, my time allotment, so I'm stopping here. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for summarizing <laughs> a lot in very short. Um, thank you very much. So, Mr. Bajiri, I would like you to bring some input, not only as a representative of the government, but also a voice from the um, the south perspective also since we are hearing a lot about the international efforts on that and also some strong legal frameworks coming from the european perspective um, do you think the future of the internet is coming from the north <laughs> and how do you feel this representation from a south perspective from the africa region and also governmental uh, thank you I hope it's not a yes or no answer. 
But um, of course, there's no question that uh, we all know the origin of the internet. But I think what is important is um, the processes around it of uh, governance. And uh, I must confess, yes, we do, we do contribute as Africa, but not as effectively as we should. And I think perhaps we are to blame for that ourselves. More for a fact that we have not put enough resources in the processes. Um, if you assessed the participants in this IGF and you try to see how many people are from government, I think civil society outweighs the number of government from the continent. And that's a reality. And I say that because from my own country, I'm the only one from government, but I've seen like six people randomly from my country. And uh, what is true is that they return and uh, make every effort to influence the agenda. Not that we close them out, but it's normally not as easy as it should be. So I think it's important that governments pay attention to the processes so that they can meaningfully participate and also associate with the issues as they are. It is true, I think at a round of uh, the World Summit for Information Society, there was a report written by PANOS, I think was the organization then, the Louder Voices report. And in that report, it was clearly documented that African countries do not participate effectively in processes such as these ones. And I think that's a very, very important point. And indeed, whereas we contribute to the infrastructure, the processes are as important as the development of the infrastructure. And um, I can only say that in some instances, certain aspects have been domesticated. In our case, we have a Data Protection and Privacy Act. I don't know whether seven is a magic number. It took us seven years as well to get that uh, done, but we have it nonetheless. We, it was only assented to in February of this very year. Uh, and basically pretty much to mirror what's happening in Europe. And I think that's something in the right direction. But overall, I must emphasize that uh, the processes as they happen here are extremely critical and it's important that uh, we in Africa pay as much attention and participate aggressively. Thank you very much. So, Carlos Afonso, as a representative of a tech NGO, civil society, and Carlos is also a very important voice on internet regulation globally and definitely in Latin America also. So, the same way, how do you perceive Latin America in this context, but also the role of civil society? Uh, Carlos was one of the builders of the Internet Bill of Rights in Brazil that should get more viral than it did, right? Yeah, when you say <laughs> Maybe this is an interesting discussion also. So uh, he's an important voice. How do you perceive the role of civil society in Latin America in this context, this regulatory context? Thanks, Eduardo. When you say builder, I uh, just need to clarify people that I'm not engineer. Uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer. Uh, and well, in this you might not be used to have lawyers being known by building things. <laughs> uh, but super quickly, uh, when we look at the situation in, in, in Latin America, I think it's interesting for us to step back and look uh, what happened uh, in the last edition on IGF when President of France, uh, Macron, gave out the speech saying uh, the, the future of the internet and most importantly of internet regulation is in between those two axes in, in which you have on one hand Silicon Valley and on the other hand China and uh, and then he he made the case for Europe to to step up to step up uh, with its own values in order to provide uh, almost like a a third way or alternative in terms of inspiration for future internet regulation. Uh, looking towards uh, other regions and especially Latin America, we can not only think if those are the only three viable uh, alternatives, and especially in a moment in which Latin America come uh, go or goes through um, 
very tro troubling times uh, in terms of uh, the political landscape changing a lot. Uh, I think this is the moment in which we need to be super cautious on how do we plug in into the debates of internet regulation, especially to avoid the usage of uh, internet in order to produce something that we can only call it digital populism. Uh, so this is something that is really important for us to take, a, to take some cautious on. And speaking of which, uh, when we talk about the future of the internet and the future of its regulation, I think it's always good for us to uh, go back to what uh, Lawrence Lessig said like uh, by the end of the 90s uh, uh, in this uh, beautiful article called The Law of the Horse, uh, when he was discussing this like four forces of regulation and that good policy making uh, on the internet needs to take a look on a legal point of view, uh, the economic forces, the social norms, and the architecture, the technical aspects. And I really think that this message, uh, it was important back in the late 90s, and is still, I would say, even more important today, because what we see nowadays is that there's um, somewhat disappointment uh, that people might feel with uh, the, the direction in which uh, internet, and internet is heading might lead people to think that only approving a specific legislation will solve magically all the problems and that regulation will steer back internet to the good old days. And I think it's important to mention that the law itself will not going to solve this problem. We need to look uh, on the economic impacts. We need to see how society reacts to, to, to one specific uh, uh, change in technology. And by the end of the day, we need to count with technology on it itself uh, in order to help us to, to, to steer us uh, back into a good direction. And since uh, we have mentioned very briefly artificial intelligence, I know this panel is about the future of the internet. But I think um, for us to keep on the back of our minds uh, the idea of artificial intelligence might be quite uh, useful because uh, what we're seeing right now is that some governments are trying to uh, go ahead and legislate on issues on artificial intelligence that are simply not there yet. Mm -hmm. And it looks almost like the governments are saying, we missed the train on the internet. So internet end up happening without our knowledge, but now that we are aware enough on this uh, tricky issue of technology, we will not let AI run amok. So I think this is something interesting for us to pay attention in order to see what will be the balance of its regulation. Are we going like fast enough, regulating on things that we are not quite aware of? Um, or is this really useful? So those would be just my, my remarks on the second round, and thanks. Excellent, so speaking about the good old days, <laughs> these seasons, how do you perceive the role of tech companies in this context? Um, as a kind of self-reflection and self-evaluation, do you think tech companies are doing a good job in achieving human rights and fulfilling these visions and principles or not? What are the steps being taken and strategies? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I only have three minutes. <laughs> but, I mean, in one sense, no. Um, obviously not. Um, because there it would not be credible to say, yes, in a room such as this with the public debates that are going on now. But in fact, my position as Director of Human Rights at Facebook, which I started just four months ago, was direct result of an acknowledgement that, in, that Facebook, in this instance, um, in its human rights impact assessment of Myanmar and what happened in Myanmar, was that it needed to do more and it needed to do it differently. Um, and so traditionally with tech companies, if I'm espousing human rights as a crucial, as the existing human rights framework, is a crucial element to be adopted in these discussions of universal, regional and domestic frameworks for thinking about the future of the internet. Um, tech companies have some strong obligation, well, some tech companies have accepted some obligations and that is through the Global Network Initiative. I, how many people here have ever heard of the Global Network Initiative? It's a floor, not a ceiling, of multi-stakeholder arrangement where the biggies, like Google and Facebook, have at least accepted a fundamental responsibility to protect users from government surveillance, arbitrary government uh, scoop-ups of data, and government suppression of freedom of expression um, 
using their through their companies. And that works pretty well. But I should note that far from all tech companies have signed up to that floor, right? So, and we have a host of emerging companies that have not and may not, right? So that's one thing. So we have a floor, but obviously I think reality and the world demands that there be more than that floor. That our understanding of the multidimensionality of human rights impacts of Facebook and all social media platforms, and in fact of all major tech companies, has advanced well beyond that concern with the Article 19 floor. And that the existing framework of the UN framework guiding principles on business and human rights, they are useful for the respect, protect and remedy framework but they are diffuse and they are perhaps more articulated towards the extractive mining companies with their emphasis on due diligence at times of entry and exit than they are for uh, internet, social media platforms or other companies where you might have 500 products in the, in the pipeline. You might not formally enter or exit any particular national space. So what does due diligence look like there? And obviously it can look like a lot more than has been done, um, but how do you make that framework and decision making count? That's what I'm leaning in to try and make happen so that we can evaluate critical decisions in country or crit critical situations for countries before we go in. But it's also not enough. Um, and I don't want to ever pretend it could be enough which is why I think with Fabrizio going back to the idea of a, a, fr you know, a discussion following up from the, the report of the universal values and the universal approach with, different, uh, with the involvement of all the different actors, but specifically recognizing that this is an ecosystem where we have ecosystem problems, we have internet problems, platform problems, social media problems, government problems, and we do need that ecosystem approach. So I'm not here to, to say that the platforms are perfect, but let us, I, I want to draw attention to that roughly 40% of my job at least, since the time I can on, has been involved in specifically keeping freedom of expression open in one Asian country that is in the bottom five countries in the world for freedom of expression, and that that matters to the 75 million people who are using that platform. So those games are not over, although we are not talking about them now in this sophisticated debate, and nor should that preoccupy us to the exclusion of all of the other challenges that people have rightly articulated, those challenges still exist. And that's why I think the UN process is probably, if handled well, is a very good way to bring those broader problems and challenges into, into the game. And again, not abandoning the... We can't have a libertarian internet. We probably don't want that libertarian version of the internet, but we still want an open and free internet. Excellent. Thank you very much for all your inputs. We have time now for some questions and also some reactions, if you want to. So you must already feel warmed up right now, so the microphone will circulate a bit. Maybe we can have like from two to two questions. Hi, I'm Yudanje from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, uh, actually. Um, one of the key things that I took away from pretty much everything uh, that everyone said uh, is A, to establish governance uh, is critical and so on and so forth. And we need to do this, we need to have good policy, we need to have good frameworks, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there are two problems at play which were implicit in what you said. The first is that it is difficult to link meat space identity to cyberspace identity and that's Partly design. That's partly architect. That's partly the architecture of the problem of the internet. Uh, that's partly a legal uh, set of policies that are missing. But there's a whole gap there that that is rather difficult to tackle. And the second is most of this very classical type of governance that we're talking about is built on the legal monopoly on violence. Right? If you do not agree to this international law that we have signed, we will lock you in a box and throw away the key. Now, how do you go about doing this when you can't establish identity, when you can't inflict physical violence on the agents who are actually using this for evil? Um, and that would, I mean, 
are there serious efforts where you're working with technical actors, where you're working with you know, legal experts, where you're working with the practicalities around the issue, because otherwise all of this just boils down to nice pieces of paper, right? It just ends at wonderful discussions of libertarian versus utilitarian ideals and our lives are not our own, from womb to tomb we are tied to others, wonderful, but it stops there. So how do you get around solving the practicality of it? You want to address one specific the question stakeholder, is open or to it's anyone general, who wants general. to take it honestly, because everyone raised these points at different times. Excellent. So let's get one more. Yeah, and and then. Thank you, Alejandro Pisanti from the National University of Mexico. Um, I, I would uh, just hang on to one uh, statement that was made by Mr. Fabrizio Hochschild which is uh, the words ungoverned spaces. Uh, the internet as an ungoverned space. There, there's no human being or, or agent of human agency like a company or a government that's not under some national authority. And to hear representatives of governments speak of ungoverned spaces means that people are ungoverned or firms are ungoverned or maybe even governments are ungoverned. Uh, what we're seeing is scaling cross-jurisdictional uh, identity management, you have friction loss, you have uh, barrier lowering, you have memory effects, but in the end, everything we see, almost everything we see on the internet is not original from the human conduct point of view. Excellent. Maybe let's take those two and then we make another round. Um, okay. Could I not so much you would respond to yours, but so like talk around it because I see some and some I some some analogies or some sort of references I can take from the conversation about AI ethics and the values of artificial intelligence and what we expect from it. It's very difficult to talk about the internet without talking about artificial intelligence. I know there is a lot of conversation internationally about principles of AI use, principles of AI deployment. Um, there's like 80 principles that have been ascribed to it. Maybe because we watch too many Hollywood films and we have so much fear about what AI is going to kind of like do to us, will run us out of our jobs, run us out of our lives, it will, it will just take over. But we have let the internet take us over. Why are we still having this conversation about values where we should be better at this by now? So that's just my, 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 that was a kick in my, 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 my gut reaction. But Carlos, I agree with you. I'm, I'm a lawyer too, all right? So I, I admit to being a lawyer. We don't have the responses. We don't have the solutions for everything. Please, no, that's not the, that's not the idea. We, we talk about having a conversation. We talk about having, breaking down the silos, multi-stakeholderism, multilateralism. We haven't really kind of like addressed it at a granular level. And Sometimes if we're going to be moving inexorably into this future about, you know, there's, there's no going back. There's no going back. There's no undoing the internet. Sorry, we're on this track. Horse is run. The horse is bolted. We, we can't shut the door. So we have to kind of like talk the horse into doing the things that we want it to do. And um, there's going to be an issue with finding common values. Let me be very clear about this. We all come from different cultures, different heritage, different social situations, different political situations. We can find some common ground, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a battle over values. It's going to be a battle over how we kind of uh, ascri ascribe the principles in, in which we say which values are important. And um, But sometimes I feel that in this conversation about values and principles, you know, is this a utilitarian approach? Is it, a, you know, a, like a Kantian approach? Is this, are we looking at, you know, are we looking at a, like a middle way? We forget whom we are supposed to be loyal to, who is going to have bear the impact of the decisions and the conversations we're having. So who are we going to be loyal to? Uh, for a bit, so you said something about doing no harm. That's a Hippocratic oath, and I'm totally on board with that. Before you do anything, who am I going to mess up? Who am I going to hurt here in doing something like this? So that is just my kick in the gut reaction to your, your, your comment, Yuda. Okay. No. 
briefly. I, I wanted to uh, agree with a gentleman from, from Mexico very much, uh, and that's exactly why uh, it's so decisive to discuss what the actual rules should be and how they will operate after all. So, uh, I mean, I, I hear this often that people say, ah, we, we, this is a lawless space, and mostly it's done by, uh, said by people who, who have a very strong interest for certain rules to come in or not to come in. Uh, you know, we, we call them lobbyists in Brussels. We have, we have many of those. So, I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's a sideshow in a way. What's clear is that the, it is a governed space. The question is, how is it governed? How is it regulated? And, you know, what is driving those regulations? Uh, are, we, are we, in fact, like like Carlos suggested, are we trying to, uh, you know, kill, kill the AI before it comes up? Uh, often, you know, you just mentioned it. I, I don't think we are there uh, in terms of defending against, against the, the, the scary robots. Uh, and therefore, I have a, a different uh, concern, uh, namely that we try to regulate something which we don't yet understand very well because it's too early days, and then we cut off certain developments. That's a very, very big discussion that we have right now because at the same time, it is also true that uh, we're talking about citizen-centric and, you know, citizens have concerns. So even if you as a, as I, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, so I'm an engineer partly, so I understand that maybe some of these concerns are, are unfounded, but they are still there and therefore they have an impact on our political, uh, you know, uh, com uh, complete situation and they drive how people vote and they drive what people find important and therefore needs to be discussed publicly. And what we're trying to do in Brussels in the last two years was to work on this AI ethics topic without just then saying, okay, and since we now had this nice conversation, how to how to be ethic, ethical about AI, so let's make it a law now, because then you know the discussion only only starts at that moment in time; it doesn't end. So that's that's where we are right now, and I think the next three four months will show how, how this discussion goes forward. And I, I'm quite confident that we will have a very sensible uh, thing coming out of this. I wanted to also answer or address the question uh, by the gentleman from from Sri Lanka um, on the uh, you you made this link to identity, but also to the difficulty of finding out you know, who it actually is at the other end. I mean, just to explain a little bit what, where our thinking is on that. And it also links to what was said earlier, that there are certain rules that we know from the analog uh, world. And so we uh, oftentimes, there's one of the starting points is to say, okay, what, how, what would it look like if we would try to apply these same rules, mutatis, mutandis, uh, online? And so in, in Europe, what we have done is to create a, a regulatory framework for electronic identity, which basically allows the governments, as also companies, to, to base themselves on a strong um, technical and, and, and legal, these two are, are important and need to go together, framework to, to work with real identities of people also online, but it doesn't require them to do so because we believe uh, that there, there's a big step between these two. Just by allowing a platform to say, okay, my business is so essential and linking to the physical world, I need to know who it is. It's very different from saying every company should know that because there are many companies that actually don't need to know that. And so what we are right now discussing is to, to go the next step and to say, okay, um, does it always have to be black or white? Do I have to basically be completely anonymous and the other side knows nothing about me? Or could there be parts in between? Maybe, i give you an example, there are certain things that uh, have a kind of age um, uh, restriction. So I think Facebook's also one of them and some other services there's a certain age that you should have to, to use them. You know, why would you have to tell that platform everything about yourself, including your address, and maybe you send, send a picture of your face, if it might be enough to just prove that you actually have attained that age? So this is one example, but you can declinate that through the whole use cases. And what we are trying right now building on is having a framework uh, to, to allow that to happen technically for those, again, governments and services and uh, companies who want to use it. And I also want to be clear, there will be some services where it might be obligatory. You think about public services, it's clear that you know, state needs to know who they are operating with. Final word on your your example with the violence in Asia. I mean, I'm coming from the cybersecurity uh, side myself, and we have this problem all the time uh, to know wh who did it in the end. But oftentimes, uh, the attribution problem, right? But oftentimes, of course, I mean, the first the first call of action is not to know who did it, but to prevent it from going on further, to shut it off, maybe to close the door that the next guy is not not walking in there, uh, and then. Oftentimes, it's even an afterthought to say, okay, now we give it to our colleagues who, who might or might not uh, have a fruitful engagement with the law enforcement authorities to find out who, who actually did this. And I don't want to deny that there's a difference between some online scam and you know, physical violence, but I'm just, just saying that, okay, there is a challenge, of course, but I don't believe that you will close it off by making a law that says everybody needs to be identified online because probably the people who want to do something bad will just ignore that. So I, mean, I think we will live in this trade-off. And by the way, final word on this, this is also an interesting trade-off in the discussion that we have in Europe between the law enforcement interests, because from a law enforcement side, it's always better to have more data because you might need it at some point in time. Whereas from the citizen-centric and you know democratic open society point of view, of course, you should start from the other way around. And so I don't think, you, you just said it earlier in another context, I don't think we will ever 
solve this problem by having one rule here or there, but we will continue to have these two perspectives clash uh, and, and you know, hopefully in a fruitful way uh, and lead to, to uh, compromises that allow us to go forward and also to allow us to uh, show to and prove to our citizens that are actually that they are safe, because I also agree with you, we won't get, be able to get back behind this, and nobody wants this. This is one of the greatest things humanity has ever done, in my personal humble opinion, and so we should do everything we can to protect it. So. Thank you very much. Do you want to immediately react? Oh. Um, just on this ungoverned species, I mean, I was, I was actually um, quoting um, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen. I, I, I of course, there is, in, in some sort of philosophical, anthropological sense, no such thing as an ungoverned space. But I, but I think, um, uh, so there I would agree with you, but it's a different level. That's not what I was alluding to. Um, I suspect in this room, um, over the past 20 years, every single one of you has got, if not one, dozens, or perhaps even hundreds of emails from somebody whose father just died and they w were a bank um, governor of such and such a bank and they have $10 million and if you would only give your bank details, um, you will get a 10% cut. And of course, I'm sure nobody in this room ever responded, but those emails go to a million people and maybe one, probably somebody my age, so not so digitally uh, versant, replies, has anybody heard ever of anybody responsible for such a scam being prosecuted? I haven't, I don't know anybody who has. That's what I mean by lack of governance. Um, if we think of terrorist recruitment, imagine in the pre-internet days how difficult it was for Osama bin Laden to go out, reach tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and try and recruit them. How many legal hurdles how many he would have to evade and overcome with the internet? Very easy. That's what I mean by ungoverned spaces. Think about um, um, uh, hate speech. Um, expressing the most obnoxious views ever and trying to do that on a mega scale in the past, you would have to use radio or media. How many newspapers with any reach would accept you reaching a large public? How many radio stations with any reach would accept you reaching a public? It would be moderated, it would be regulated. On the internet, it's not. That's what I mean by ungoverned spaces. In terms of data, I was with a major um, uh, AI company in Japan, and I said, what, di what regulations do you follow to um, how you handle data privacy? And they said, well, in China, we follow the national law. In Japan, we follow the national law. And elsewhere in Asia, where there's no national law, we follow our own regulations. Well, that's regulated, but it's not regulated by a publicly accountable body. So that's what I also mean by ungoverned spaces. So I do think um, there's um, a, a problem. I don't think one should blame the, ca the, the platforms. I think the problem comes from policymakers not having kept up. And this goes to the point that was raised by the other speaker. Engineers move fast and break things. Engineers find solutions. They work through trial and error. They make, get things 500 times wrong and then they get it right and they learn. Policymakers are paralyzed by difficulty and they don't want to do anything until they have the perfect solution. So, so the technology has advanced at a huge speed and the policymakers are desperately trying to catch up and haven't done a very good job. And that's where I think we need to do better, but not by together with the horse to, to, to use, I mean, in dialogue with the horse. Um, but, but we have a lot of catching up to do. Let me just get two questions here, and, and you can react, please. Those two, please. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, my name is Janis Karkvinsch. I'm uh, representing here uh, government of Latvia. I'm an ambassador of Latvia to you and in Geneva, and I happen to be associated with the World Summit second phase. So um, it is a very interesting conversation, especially now with, with the distance from 2005. 
when we were talking about uh, mostly about access uh, to internet and a little bit about oversight of one government over uh, critical internet resources. And at that time we felt that this is extremely complex and complicated. Actually, uh, now we see that uh, once we are moving towards discussion on actual use of internet, it's bec be becoming uh, much more complex than it used to be and most likely will not get uh, simpler uh, going in the future. So we're doomed to uh, address those complex issues and try to understand them. And here com comes the, the issue of legislation. I think engineers can afford the mistake. Legislators uh, most likely cannot. And it is be uh, uh, better to uh, let them understand uh, complexities associated with issue uh, in consultations uh, with, with industry representatives, with civil society representatives, and then make uh, the, uh, the uh, proposal, legislative proposal or regulatory proposal rather uh, than rush and do uninformed decision making, which most likely uh, is the detriment of uh, evolution of digital. And let me leave you with the uh, last thought is that um, now we're talking about uh, governance of digital and digital as a separate topic. I would bet that in maybe five, seven years from now, we would stop talking about digital as separate, but rather we will be talking about everything uh, by default digital. So as a result, most likely IGF will turn completely in its nature and will be a cross-cutting discussion about everything that we're doing uh, rather than specifically uh, focusing uh, on digital as a separate topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So here, yeah, I would just ask you to be b very brief on the questions, please, for, it's for the other people also to be able to reply. Yeah, here and then the other place. Yeah, then you can react. Another two questions. Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Julia, and I have a question related to data protection compliance, um, which was one of the what's uh, mentioned in the beginning. So recently, the UN released a report about um, digital interdependency, and at some point, the report states that we need to um, guarantee data protection through two such as anonymization, but we also need to regard companies' business models. <coughs> The problem is that these business models not always allow for the use of tools such as anonymization or even for compliance with um, basic obligations such as purpose limitation or even the choice of an adequate lawful basis for some types of processing activities. Um, and from where I see, um, theory is very far apart from reality still. So with that in mind, um, Mr. Hoshield, would you say that UN's report is actually contradictory to the business models used by companies such as Amazon, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and so on? And if so, what are you doing as an institution to bridge this gap in terms of accountability and regulation? And Ms. Sisons? Um, considering Facebook's scenario of massive processing of personal data, as well as its usage by political parties to spread political ads, which not rarely contain misinformation and are used to target individuals who maybe had never given their consent to such purpose, um, what are you doing as a company to bridge this gap and comply with the GDPR? Is Facebook going to position itself against these practices, like Google and Twitter just did, or is it going to abstain from taking action? Thank you very much. Oh, now I get it. <laughs> okay. So now I'm given the question. What I wanted to say before is I do think it is very complex, uh, obviously, but I also think you can make, we can also, in this difficult conversation, despite the complexity, try and um, adhere to some important principles, such as being citizen-centered, such as ensuring basic human rights norms that are global and globally agreed are put into regulatory frameworks, such as that you shouldn't be giving data on citizens to countries that haven't signed the ICCPR and haven't signed the Convention Against Torture, right? Th those are not particularly controversial things. Um, and that we also need to distinguish a bit between internet platform, computer science, and uh, business 
problems because AI, which is one of the great topics and is used by some of the platforms, is more than just a social media problem. Um, for example, I don't think it should be controversial that we could all look at the need to ban or, uh, AI in killer robots. I mean, these are all fundamental things that, that at least are basic flaws uh, that I should give cheer. I think we can set, um, we as a human being. On Facebook, and, so, and um, certainly Facebook, as far as I understand it, um, complies with GPDR. It has, it, is, it has an Irish jurisdiction and a US jurisdiction. Um, and it is also, of course, under a consent degree now from the FTC that I think is going to result in some extremely important changes. So I'm not going to whitewash this issue or tell you it's all fantastic. But I do think that this is a pretty important moment to also look at those ad targeting practices. Um, the data processing at Facebook, which has been extensive for its business model, um, is both compliant and in many ways and problematic to people's sense of what privacy should be. And I don't mean to sugarcoat that. I do mean to be deeply involved in that conversation. On political advertising, which is, Facebook has global policies, um, which is easy and convenient, but also very important, right? So that we can hold the line on many good policies around the world. For example, the policies that we will not give your private user data to law enforcement without an appropriate uh, and lawful uh, request through lawful channels, which we may do under some very specific circumstances, unlike various other platforms, right? So I think the answer there has been that this is an incredible, and it, it, is, it is personally for me a very, very, very important question and a very difficult one where obviously the, the position that the company has taken has been very unpopular and that they have said that they will be looking at this position, but I can't tell you now that it's necessarily going to change. What I can say is that there's an active culture of debate inside the company that complements the culture of debate outside the company, but that the company, the US-based company, is also working in a framework where there is very, very weak regulation of political ads by the FTC and the Federal Election Commission. And, the, and in fact, in many, in broadcast media, I understand, are required to take ads without fact-checking. So it's not mere, merely a willful posture, um, but it is an extremely complex one given the US's underlying <laughs> framework and, and, and even legal, uh, require, uh, legal vacuum in terms of ad regulation for political advertising. Thank you very much. Carlos, do you want to react? And then Mr. Horschel. But super quickly, just to uh, go back to uh, Yanni's comments on uh, the future of the internet and by seven years from now, we're not being discussing internet or digital anymore. Uh, <coughs> since this is a panel to look towards the future of the internet, I think we can, uh, Stress the thing that is quite uh, uh, repeated all the time, but I think it's important to mention. Uh, maybe the future of the internet is for the internet to be invisible, for the idea that we are not going to speak about like online, offline, uh, internet, or if you are like a to enter the internet, that will not be even like a, a, an expression that will be understood by uh, future generations. But this is just to say uh, that when we end up doing this, uh, there might be some traps that we might need to avoid in the some so-called disappearance of the internet, which is for us not to take uh, attention, not to pay attention on the features, on the characteristics of the internet that end up uh, being on its essence and that end up leading us to the point that we are uh, right now, which is the fact that the internet is a network of networks, the, the fact that the internet is decentralized and how much that has been important to the whole development of the internet, the idea that the internet uh, is open in a way that it allows uh, permissionless innovation. So those key features of the internet, I think there will be even more important when we look towards this uh, future of the internet, and especially when we want to do this comparison with other technologies such as AI as we are doing right now. Like uh, AI is quite different from internet in many things in terms of regulation. For instance, the, 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 the capacity of AI to produce physical harm it's bigger than the one that you might find on the internet uh, on general terms. Uh, when you talk about um, uh, AI and internet, you have the whole debate on access to. So the, the debate to the access to internet is something that is, of course, still very important, but it has been uh, in the last decade uh, predominant. But when it comes to AI, are we talking about access to AI? 
like uh, people might have been impacted by AI deployments even before we start addressing issues about um, about access. And by the end of the day, the difference between those who will be able to have access to uh, those advancements and those who doesn't have, it will make your the type the way that you work look like you were in the Stone Age in comparison to the others. You might live less. So we were talking about quality of life, uh, longevity of people, uh, well-being. So I think this is really important. And just to conclude very quickly, uh, addressing one of the first remarks from a gentleman uh, from Sri Lanka. Um, one of the ideas on how we can make this concrete, this vision that we are all sharing here, if we take a look on this uh, for uh, access of uh, internet regulation, very quickly, if we take the issue of disinformation, so if we think about law, approving a law to fight disinformation, hmm, might be one step, but how can you do it? How will you frame it? But if we take a, a, like a more broader perspective, we will see that we have uh, Law can provide some inputs, of course, uh, but we need to focus on the economic aspects. We need to understand the economic chain value of producing fake news, who is profiting from that, where the money comes from, what are the economics uh, of producing false news. We have to take a look on the social aspects, which is uh, digital literacy, how people understand uh, what is false and what is not, what they should share, what they should not share. So there is a social component that is really important. And by the end of the day, the technology itself, that it can be a very important tool to make uh, sure that we might uh, avoid some of the negative impacts of this scenario. Just to give an example, uh, our institution in Brazil, ITS, has developed this uh, 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 tool we call Pega bot, which could be lousily translated as bot catcher, no, bot catcher, which is a botometer of some sort that you can like uh, insert a Twitter handle and see how likely this Twitter account is uh, automatized or not. Uh, there are a bunch of other uh, uh, tools that end up doing the same. So I think going through these four uh, uh, areas, uh, thinking about internet regulation, might be a good way to move forward with some practical results. Okay, thank you. Do you want to react very quickly? Um, just two two points on um, on on data um, measures. Um, I, I think the practices between um, companies differ enormously. So that, that's my um, understanding. And I think um, certain regional uh, re regulations that one or way or another have a global reach because other countries are either imitating them or because other countries want to do business with that region, um, like the GDPR, which one way or another now people say impacts on 120 countries, is transforming that. And my sense is also, although I'm sure this is not universal, is that business is also looking for more universal um, normative approaches. Because obviously it uh, makes for much easier uh, business approaches if they, if they have one set of legislation or approach to apply by globally rather than having to adapt their approach country by country. So I think we have to continue to try and um, globalize best practices, but that will take a concerted effort of governments um, and of the private sector to help happen. Just uh, one word on this pacing challenge and the, the, the difference between you know, technology charging ahead and legislators dragging their feet. I mean, I, I think there's, that, that is a case, but the, the sad thing is that legislators do act quickly, but usually after catastrophes and not before them. Uh, the Security Council in 2001 adopted binding uh, resolutions on, for the first binding resolutions on the use of internet for counter-terrorism, for, 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 uh, against um, violent extremism after the London attacks. The Council of Europe uh, uh, um, adopted their fastest ever additional protocol in 2015 after the Paris terrorist attacks. Um, th there was very quick action at a national level, to some degree at an international level, after the Christchurch attacks. You know, the, the, it would be good if in future um, some of that speed could happen before rather than after the catastrophe. And I think in the digital era, 
where um, uh, technology changes the world at an unprecedented speed, um, keeping up the same old-fashioned speed of legislation just won't be good enough. Um, we also need to grow more flexible, more nimble, those of us working in the po public policy field, and not let just let technology um, move ahead into the next century while we're still stuck in the past. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Uh, unfortunately, our time is over, so you can definitely reach the panelists on the corridor. So this is how the future of Internet is going to be, with some overlaps concerning the guiding principles and values, but definitely different priorities. So since we talked a lot about AI, maybe the robot can decide the future of Internet on our behalf. So thank you very, very much for our speakers, and thank you for all your contributions. Thank you very much.